Par exemple, je me suis toujours interdit de penser à une vie future, mais j'ai toujours cru que l'instant de la mort est la norme et le but de la vie. Je pensais que pour ceux qui vivent comme il convient, c'est l'instant où, pour une fraction infinitésimale du temps, la vérité pure, nue, certaine, éternelle entre dans l'âme. Je peux dire que jamais je n'ai désiré pour moi un autre bien. Simone Veil, Attente de Dieu, 1942 This is the transdiscipline Simone Veil den Collectif. For our conference on Simone Veil, Death, Text, Resonance, Simone Veil and Writing Towards Death, in July 2020, we invited scholars from different fields to choose a text by Simone Veil or a somehow related writer or thinker to read and discuss. This time we are going to hear Simon Kotwa and Hartmut Rosa together tracing the movements of textual experiments that search for and attempt to approach that which we cannot understand but sometimes experience, that is, the infinite, the numinous and the ineffable. Today both engage with the philosophy of Simon Weil and present their thoughts if we can resonate with death. Simone Kotva is a philosopher and theologian at the University of Cambridge. Her research focuses on the philosophy of religion, environmental ethics, as well as magic and the occult. This year she published her new book titled Effort and Grace on the Spiritual Exercise of Philosophy at Bloomsbury Press. Hello. I want first to thank the organizers for assembling this virtual platform. It's an amazing achievement and being part of it is a pleasure and an honor. And I look forward to our conversation following. So I have titled my talk, Attention, Death, Ecology. And what I propose to do is think aloud with you for 20 minutes or so, giving you my interpretation of what Helmut Rosa means by resonance. I was introduced to resonance whilst writing about Simone Weil's religious philosophy. I thought I understood what Rosa meant by the word because I recognized something very similar in Weil's philosophical terminology, especially in her discussions of what she calls attention. And what I wanted to do today, seeing as how so many of you are interested in Weil, is to think about resonance as a form of attention. Now, my interest in Vey is prompted by the fatal, as in death-dealing, qualities she imparts to attention, wonder and openness. By the question of how to think about a philosopher's attention as a training for dying, more broadly. And by a wish to bring death into relationship with a world attentiveness born out of several years working, writing and activating ecological thought. Vey's is attention that opens perception to the outside. But what is this outside? And how does attention facilitate receptivity to it? What grants ability to practice attention, tending to use a key phrase in Weil's terminology, rather than commanding one's surroundings? But in order to answer those questions, I begin with Rosa and resonance. So there is a fascinating passage in Rosa's recently translated book where it is explained that resonance is not passivity. Passivity is giving in to this or that belief, this or that opinion. Resonance is about noticing others as they are, not as they are believed to be. So it's necessary here to take an active role. It's about, writes Rosa, self-efficacy, autonomy and emancipation. And no one can do that work for us. At the same time, we learn from Rosa that resonance cannot be comprehended within a theory of autonomy. It cannot be comprehended within a theory of autonomy. This is so because although resonance is achieved by the self, it isn't achieved by the self to the exclusion of other selves. Resonance is, writes Rosa, no longer domination and control, but listening and responding. So Rosa calls this quality of resonance dispositional. To listen and respond are examples of dispositional resonance. It's necessary, I think, to consider carefully this phrase. A disposition isn't something I do. It's something I have, like a habit. This means that in relation to it, I am passive. 
as I would be in relation to a habit I had acquired and which prompted me to act spontaneously, that is, without conscious effort. In such circumstances, while it is true to say that I act, I'm certainly doing something. I'm no longer fully in control of my actions. So you can see why Hosea says that resonance cannot be comprehended within a theory of autonomy. We can think of it in terms of the distinction between paying attention and being attentive, a distinction that suggests itself from Rosa's idea of resonance as dispositional. So paying attention would be autonomy. Here I make a discrete effort, focusing my senses on this or that object, person, idea. For this reason, though, what I notice is limited to what I have chosen to allow myself to notice. Being attentive, by contrast, is a state rather than an action. Here I act, but I'm not fully in charge or in control because my actions have become habitual, meaning they have become passive, but meaning too that they have become spontaneous. So for this reason, what I notice is not limited to what I choose to notice, but is open to a wider field of possibility. In this state, resonance is not something I do, but something I am. In this state, while I am active, nonetheless my actions have been modulated by passivity. This would be dispositional resonance. But the question is whether it is possible to enter into resonant relationship to death, and so far death has not been mentioned. And yet we have been very close to the matter, for we have been speaking of passivity. And what is death, if not the passivity as such of the organisms? So when we die, we give in to inertia. We surrender autonomy and lose our selfhood. Resonating with death would mean becoming in some manner passive ourselves. And such is not possible if resonance is not passivity. That would be the initial conclusion we could draw from Rosa's reasoning. But if, as I have suggested, it transpires that resonance is in fact a passive modality, if it is dispositional in addition rather than in contradiction to being autonomous, then the concept begins to look rather different, as does its relationship to death. Rosa, however, does not call resonance passivity, and evidently what I've been describing as a passive modality, attentiveness, does not amount to inertia. So we're far from what we might say an ontic sense of death. If resonance is passive, it's not so in the sense of the organisms grinding to a halt. What confronts us here is an action performed passively, not passivity as such. And yet death is explained only partially by passivity. So to think of death as passivity in an absolute sense will obscure the existential as well as biological confusion that exists between living and dying. Can we say with any certainty where the one ends and the other begins? Ontologically, it is possible to say that death is, if not experienced, then at any rate intimated also in life. Wherever our actions are modulated passively in such a way that we lose a sense of selfhood, and are overwhelmed by the other. When we lose the sense of self in this way, when we become so absorbed in what is other to ourselves, person, place, creature, idea, that we forget for a moment about our agency, these are death-like experiences, minor mortalities, intimations of fatality. So that is my take on the Rosa's concept of resonance, and those who know Vey's work will already have sensed how I arrived at it. A dispositional rather than self-efficacious modality appears also in, in what Vey calls attention. So in French, the word attention, l'attention, is related to waiting, l'attente, which we can compare to attendant in English, comparing the word l'attente to attendant. With the shift that attendance brings to attention, attention comes to be modulated by passivity. And Vey often uses the image of passivity when describing attention. Attention is, she writes, a passive activity, a negative effort. Attention comes to consist in suspending our thought, leaving it detached, empty. Above all, our thought should be empty, waiting, not seeking anything, but ready to receive in its naked truth, the object. Vey takes as her principal case John of the Cross description of prayer as passive loving attention. Among the classical accounts of prayer, this is the one most obviously designed to turn attention 
into attendance, into attentiveness, and contrasts this with attention as it is imagined by modern philosophers, for whom attention is all about reasoning, exercising the will, and making decisions. Only the initial stages of prayer are called discursive or active in John's method, while the better part of the practice is meant to be performed in a state of receptivity, which John recounts in several places as not only the opposite of activity, but the opposite of autonomous volition, a dying of the self, and an abandonment of the will. The self dies, that is, a person paying intense attention to God, will at some point experience a loss of awareness of what they're doing, resulting in an ecstasy where the whole sphere of individual agency seems absorbed by the object of attention. Will power and active self-agency contribute nothing here, making the state comparable to an erotic union in which active decision-making has been suspended. The idea that by means of the passive mode of attention a person cultivates the ability to love is central to this science of prayer. The aim of it is the love of God. Moreover, Vey's interpretation describes the process in terms of physical as well as spiritual passivity, because the ability to be attentive and absorbed by the other, to love, is one that she observes is often triggered by a person incurring near fatal injuries or especially living with chronic pain. When I am in pain, I am forced into a state of passivity that awakens a spontaneous awareness of the suffering of others. That is, being passive physically makes me, or at any rate has the potential to make me passive spiritually. Spontaneity is the passivity of the will. And it is this passive awareness of the other that they thinks of as mystical absorption. Here, close or prolonged proximity to ontic death may result in a series of ontological deaths or spontaneous instances of self-forgetting, compassion, that succeed in removing attention from a theory of autonomy, to use Rosa's expression. It goes without saying, though, that unlike spiritual passivity, physical passivity, pain, chronic pain, does not result in increased attentiveness necessarily, or even most of the time. Brushing up against death or living with chronic pain may just as easily close a person off from the ability to love. There is nothing spiritually beneficial about physical passivity or trauma as such, and Ve often points out how moments when we are so lost in happiness that we forget about our own selves achieve the same end and are obviously preferable as means of achieving openness. Even so, because in either case we are talking of a passive mode of being, the likeness to death is difficult to circumvent. And here I would like to recall the way death was used as a spiritual technology by those early philosophers who considered philosophy itself to be a training for dying, in Plato's expression. The idea is often taken to reflect a pessimistic attitude, but this fails to recognise the purpose of the philosophy in question, which was not, in the first place, to escape the world, but to cultivate toward it wonder and astonishment. Among the Socratic philosophers, at least, training for death seems very close to training for attentiveness and wonder, the art of dying presented as but another aspect of the art of noticing. For there is, if not an identity, then certainly a structural homology between the style of wonder and the style of death. When we are attentive, our actions are passive, and it is this stylistics of passivity that brings us into a relationship ineluctably with death, but also with wonder and astonishment. Now, what I would like to do for the remaining few minutes is to think a bit more about training for dying as a training in attentiveness. It's an image that has come up frequently in recent years, owing to the devastating consequences planet-wide in reach of inattentiveness, not only as a result of humans failing to notice humans, but also as a result of humans failing to notice non-humans and the other than human more broadly. We're forced to this conclusion in discussing also the current pandemic, which would not be possible without inattentiveness to ecosystems caused by carbon-heavy lifestyles encouraging excessive and frequent travel, nor of course without the unwise handling of slaughtered poultry, which represents another aspect of the climate crisis. Two essays, one by Roy Scranton and the other by Robert Bringhurst and Jan Zwicky, thus treat the ancient practice of training for dying as a condition for sustainable modes of earth living.
death governs earth life as a reminder of finitude that opens perception to the outside. It does this by involving agency in passivity, by means of which the pace of carbon-heavy life is slowed down and the fields of perception are widened to let in that which would otherwise not be noticed. Death in these recent essays is both the thing we are attentive to, but also the state of attentiveness. Death is a stylistics, specifically, of course, a stylistics of passivity. To Western philosophers since at least the early modern era, this passive mode of attention was known for a long time as animal or vegetal. It was the mode of a creature able only to have their attention arrested involuntarily, rather than turn it to this or that end at will, as humans are able to do. Typically, attentiveness for this reason was viewed with suspicion as a lower or less evolved form of attention. In places such as the ones I have mentioned, this is beginning to change. So strong is the sense that human beings are not superior in their mode of relating to the world that non-human styles of attention are now explored and studied with seriousness. Michael Mader, the phenomenologist of plant life, even goes so far as to call the plant's mode of attention paradisiacal on account of its passivity, on account of its passivity, which allows the plant to notice the elements at all times. His work cites scientific research on the life of plants, unjustly considered insensitive by philosophers, but which, when examined closely, by far exceed human beings in their attentiveness to what is going on around them with regard to the levels of light, heat, moisture, movement, vibration. They are constantly in touch with the elements, attending to the sun with every part of their bodies, Whereas, Mada goes on, our human attention span is shorter, receptive capacity weaker, attachment to whatever or whoever we attend to less faithful, so that we have, quote, lost the paradisiacal ability to attend to others in absolute openness. We have lost the paradisiacal ability to attend to others in absolute openness. I suspect ecological thinking is one of the few places in philosophy today where attention is spoken of in terms comparable to Vey's. I mentioned Scranton, Bringhurst and Zwicky and Marder. I could also mention Isabel Stenger's call for what she calls slow attention. But long before the emergency of environmentalism or indeed of Vey's religious philosophy, there was already a good context for considering attention in this way. As I indicated earlier, the literature of spiritual direction of John of the Cross theorised dying to the self as a passive mode of attention. It also, and this is not often noted, imagined that practice of dying to self in terms of an attunement to non-human understanding. Remember, Marder's plants. Given the nature of the non-human God, in which the self was thought to be absorbed during prayer, the literature of spiritual exercise made frequent recourse to non-human creatures as examples to imitate. So this is how the 17th century theologian and mystic Jacques Benigne Bossuet writes, Like a plant unfolding itself to the rays of the sun, the soul, when it is open and attentive to the sun of justice, becomes enriched by all kinds of divine virtue. Like a plant unfolding itself to the rays of the sun, the soul, when it is open and attentive to the sun of justice, becomes enriched by all kinds of divine virtue. And not only, of course, in the West. The classical manuals of yoga are full of comparisons that assimilate the yogin to a plant. And this homology, remarks Mercia Eliade, would imply no pejorative judgment, even if it were adequate to the reality of the situation. The vegetable modality is not an impoverishment, but quite the contrary, an enrichment of life. The vegetable modality, meaning the passive modality. Parts of this tradition are recovered also by Vey, who in her notebooks and letters likes comparing attention in its passive modality to a plant's comportment toward the sun, the same image we saw in Bossuet. In Some Thoughts on the Love of God, an essay that Vey wrote some, at some point between 1940 and 1942, she compares divine economy itself to an ecosystem of attention. God is like the sun, paying attention to creation by means of solar energy, 
where creatures in turn are like the plants who live by virtue of sunlight and who respond to this solar attention by themselves attending to God. She writes, the only effort we can make towards the good is so to dispose our souls that it can receive grace, and it is grace which supplies the energy needed for this effort. Now, all these passive modalities and vegetable soteriologies signal a distinct habit or repeated exercise whereby the mental activity in question is slow enough to allow for noticing. The art of noticing is what links spiritual aspirant to plant and the unremittingly attentive nature of the thing noticed, God or solar energy, is what links in turn the non-human to the more than human. Of course, it is unlikely that Bossuet or any other classical author would have approached the comparison of prayer to plant life in the sense suggested by Marder's or Vey's use of a similar comparison, since for the classical writers, what was noticed was principally a matter of the interior life. But then the classical writer's understanding of the interior life as itself a complex and lively flow of impressions or workings makes the link to sensory perceptions unavoidable. The line between supernatural gift and solar energy is blurred. In order to notice one, it is necessary to notice the other. The distinctness of this recent environmentalism consists in the way it engages with the passive modalities of attentiveness. Modalities that, in the broader discussion of what an ecological ethic should be or what it might look like, too often are ignored. Impatient to act, we are wary of anything that looks like time-wasting, and an action demanding as much time and patience as attention, whether the context is religious or no, inevitably slows things down. Yet slowness is not opposed to change. Changing human behaviour is slow work, a dying to the self. And change in human behaviour is now what is at stake. After all, even the technological fixes and climate repair schemes proposed by scientists today have little or no effectiveness unless there is significant change in human behaviour. In this sense, climate repair is an ethical question before and certainly simultaneously with it being an atmospheric or geophysical one, or to put it in the terms Pierre Ador once used, while applying them to a planetary crisis he can envisage only dimly, it's a question of spiritual technologies, as much as, if not more than, of techno-fixes pertaining to carbon capture. So techno-fixing the earth implies fixing techniques of human ways of earth living, confirming thereby the perils of attempting environmental action without critical thinking engaged at the level of individuals. As hazardous as it is to ignore the summons of the present emergency, as hazardous is it to throw out the spiritual technologies that would facilitate the long-term transformation of human behaviour that will address the causes of the planetary emergency at hand. Thank you very much for your time. Hartmut Rosa is a philosopher and sociologist at the University of Jena and the director of the Max Weber Center for Advanced Cultural and Social Studies. With his resonance theory and his sociology of time, he currently ranks as one of Germany's most influential social philosophers. All right. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much uh, for giving me the chance to participate in this uh, very interesting Death Text Resonance conference and thanks a lot to the organizers for organizing this, this event in, this, uh, difficult, in these difficult times. Uh, I'm very happy to be part of it uh, and uh, I'm really looking forward uh, to also hearing the contributions of all others and our discussions. I do have a small problem, a slight problem, however, um, uh, being that I'm not really an, really an expert on death. I have not really systematically worked on, on the problem of finitude and death, even though I've given some considerations to this problem. And I'm certainly not an expert on Simon Wey, even so I have to say that in the last, particularly over this weekend, I really immersed in her writings and I got very fascinated by, by them. <clears throat> so I think I, um, I should do more on it. Uh, but right now, what I want to offer you really is a very tentative, wild, daring, perhaps a little speculative um, um, 
introduction to what I think uh, we could make or I could make uh, out of the problem of death and uh, through a perspective of Simone Weil um, for this conference. All right. So um, the topic is beyond reach. Can we be in resonance with death? I mean, that's the problem I want to tackle, right? Is it possible to really be in a kind of resonating, resonant relationship with death itself? And what could set, could that mean? And what could it do to us really to be in such a relationship? How, how could we conceive of it? Okay. So I want to move in. Uh, I hope this works. So I, I, I have not used this uh, PowerPoint technology so far, but uh, I think it, it looks quite okay to me. <laughs> okay, I want to move in four steps, right? First, I, I want to say something uh, about what resonance is, what kind. It's for me, it's a special form of relationship, uh, of a relationship between a subject and the world, or between actually two objects. But in that case, when I talk about death, it's a subject and some other. Uh, and of course, those in the doctoral IGS, uh, in the doctoral school know about this, they, they can skip this section. Then I really want to, sh then I want to, uh, uh, to think about death. And my claim there will be that I believe that death is the one thing in this world we probably cannot really get in resonance with, right? At least not straightforwardly and maybe not at all. I'm very skeptical about the idea of being in, 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 re in um, resonance with death, uh, as I will show you there. And then I will uh, talk about uh, the, the fact that we can, of course, be in resonance uh, not with death, but with our mortality. And of course, maybe also with the dead, right? I mean, I mean, um, whether or not the dead really answer us or respond to us might be a different question, but that's the same problem, like uh, being in resonance with nature or with God or with any other of those, what I call vertical uh, axis of resonance. But certainly people can uh, kind of develop a certain form of connection to those who have gone before. Uh, but that's of course is not a, a, re, a resonance or re, a relationship to death itself. And then in the last part, I want, nevertheless, with what I've understood or what I've read from Simon Weil, think about the possibility of a different form of relationship to the universe, to life, and therefore a different relationship of death to death, which might be a particular form of resonance. Um, I'm not yet quite sure. It's really just an offering. Uh, I, I, I hope it might be a kind of impulse and an invitation to a discussion. Discuss, discussion I also want to have with you. Okay, so let's get started. What is resonance? This is the easy part for me because I've explained it a hundred of times, but maybe not to the people, of course, in, in, in this conference, which uh, is a, a very, very interesting conference. Okay, so my, my idea is that resonance is a form of a relationship, a form of being in the world, which is a form of relating to the world, and it's the world of people, it's the world of things, it's the wor world of existential realities, utter ultimate reality is like nature, like the cosmos, like the universe, like life in itself and so on. And this relationship is uh, marked by the fact that it's not instrumental, right? And it's not just causal or mechanical, but it's a kind of intrinsic relationship, which of course has some connection to meaning. Right? It means something uh, to the subject and it, it kind of has an internal grip uh, or touch on, on our souls, on, on our beings. Um, and such resonances, resonant relationships we can have in dialogue, for example, in a conference like this, right? Or in a discussion which might follow uh, this, uh, presentations, these presentations. Uh, but we can also be in resonance, uh, of course, with loved ones, with friends in politics. We can be in resonance with the um, music we hear, with ideas we read, with nature we walk through or experience, and also in work, work when we work on something, we can get in resonance with it. So what does resonance mean? It's a, as I said, it's a form of relationship which, which consists of four uh, basic elements. The first is affection, right? the thing we encounter, the other person, the music I hear, the book I read, affects me, it touches me, right? It does something to me. You could actually say it grips me. Or I like Bruno Latour's um, uh, way of putting it when he says, something is calling me, it speaks to me. This is actually an everyday experience when we say this, this uh, picture on the wall somehow speaks to me, right? It does something to me. There's something in it 
which is of importance in itself, so to speak. Right? But I like also, as I said, I like this idea of something is calling me. And, and then, of course, I'm, a, I'm tempted to answer, to reach out right, and make a connection with a thing that calls me. And this can be a melody, an idea, or a person calling me, or, or a mountain, or, or the ocean, right, or whatever it is. Um, or, a, or actually the text I'm writing on, right, like right now. I think I had some resonance, moments of resonance when working on death, because I thought, no, oh, this is interesting, particularly in the later parts of my uh, my presentation, where I I really feared at one point I might get obsessed with this uh, topic of uh, death and resonance with death, right? That's, it affects me and I reach out. I want to become, as you see here on the slide, I, I, I experience self-efficacy. I can do something with it. I can react to it. I can even work on it in a certain way. And therefore, and thereby, so the second I call emotion moving outwards, emovere, right? And feeling self-efficacy in that um, way. It's not self-efficacy in the psychological sense of Bandura, which is about controlling the other side, but it's about having the capacity to, to reach out and get in contact right, uh, with the other. So you see already from this presentation that resonance is an in-between, in the in-between myself and this other thing I'm in resonance with. And it, if I if such a relationship of resonance to a book, an idea, music, a melody, a piece of work, the mountain, the ocean, whatever it is, God, the Bible, uh, comes uh, comes into being, then it transforms me, and actually it transforms uh, the the thing, right? At least in the sense of its meaning to me. So transformation is a vital element of resonance, and, and uh, Bruno Latour again says this is uh, when we feel alive, right? Aliveness is really the sensation of being connected to something that grips me, affection, and transforms me. Right. And I believe you, being alive and, and the yearning for life or for true life, for intense life, is the yearning for being touched and transformed, but not just in a passive sense, like, you know, if something hurts me or hits me or rapes me in the in the worst uh, sense right then i'm also my, then i'm quite certainly also transformed but there it lacks self efficacy my consent my opening up to this thing right so it's a, so resonance is a form of transformation which is i call in a med medio passive state right i'm kind of something is done to me but i'm also capable of reaching out to do something myself to the transform to the transformative process on both both ends right and the thing is the fourth thing the fourth element is that this is unpredictable or non engine oh, I, I misspelled on non engineerability uh, um, it's the german term unverfügbarkeit and it's very hard to translate it's the the, the book on this topic uh, which will be published with polity soon it will have the title uncontrollability it's not a perfect um, a translation of unverfügbarkeit but there is no perfect translation for it what i mean is that resonance is kind of open ended in a twofold sense. One thing is you can never enforce or engineer resonance, right? I can, even if I, I can decide now I want to play my favorite piece of music and I push the button or click the button or however you listen to music, and it might well be that nothing happens. I'm not touched, I'm not transformed, I'm actually bored or angry or tired or depressed or whatever it is. Resonance, you can never predict resonance for sure, right? Of, of course, you can increase the likelihood. But sometimes you meet your friends with the highest expectations or your loved ones, and, and you maybe you install a candle, light dinner, and, and there is no resonance, right? This, these are painful moments. But the other thing, the other element, the other moment of unpredictability or non-controllability or non-engineerability is that if it happens, right, something touches you, transforms you, and you reach out and, um, and, and, and enter into this dynamic relationship, then no one can predict what the outcome of this transformation will be. My favorite example here is a is a conference like the one we are having here. Uh, we might not get in resonance because I just say what I always say, you say what you always wanted to say, and then we go home and maybe we still think it was nice. But if there's resonance, then we all transform. We, we collectively in a kind of, it's an in-between. In the exchange of thoughts and arguments, we move to a place we have not been before in thinking right about death or Simon Weil and, uh, and and no one can predict where this will happen when it will happen and what the outcome will be so resonance is essentially vitally unpredictable okay so and, and in, in terms of te temporality it's quite interesting because it's intense moment which kind of connect 
from the past to the future, right? They, they established an axis of resonance between past and future. Okay. So I move to the second uh, argument. My argument here really is that we basically it's, as I said, I'm very skeptical about the idea of being in resonance with death. Why is it? Because actually death is not, it, it is not engineerable, right? No, it's it's not accessible to us. Well, I mean, I have to qualify my argument here a little. I, I claim that um, that resonance is utterly non-engineerable. It's unverfügbar. And that means you, you even if you, uh, if you get in touch if you play your favorite piece of music or if you watch your favorite movie or image or read your favorite text like the Bible or the Capital by Marx, two things Simon Weil would have loved, um, um, uh, uh, it, it's, un it's unclear whether you'll get in resonance with it. But the other side of this non-engineerability or unpredictability is that it's, it is possible that you get in resonance even with the things you think they are least likely to get in resonance with, right? You read the book you hate most or you meet the person you fear most and still it's possible that all of a sudden the perspective changes, the frame changes, right? You could say, and there is a resonance where you least expected it. Actually, resonance very op often happens where you least or where you don't expect it, right? And then all of a sudden something opens up and there's resonance. Now my claim is yes, Yes, but you cannot get in touch in resonance with death. Why not? Well, because because in order to get in to, to enter into resonance with something, you have to have some experience of it and some access to it. I mean, it's very easy the argument here. You cannot be in resonance with Beethoven's Fifth Symphony if you've never heard it. Actually, that's not quite true, right? You can well imagine living in conditions where you read books. And, and stories about what Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is. And you develop an idea of it and you fall in love with this Fifth Symphony and the descriptions of it, even if even you've never heard it, that's possible, right? But still I claim you cannot do the same with death because, we, okay, we have this near-death experiences, whatever they are. I claim it's not the experience of death. It's not an encounter with death in and of itself, right? So. Uh, the problem with death, of course, is that when you really touch it, when you really have the experience, you lose the capacity to resonate because I believe resonance is really, it's an element of, 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 of life, right? Of the vital thing and life ends once you die. I, I sometimes said a bit jokingly, you cannot fall in resonance with the atomic bomb or with a nuclear power reactor because if you get in resonance with it, it touches and transforms you, you are dead. Right. So, um, but, but death, I think, is, is the, it's the climax of this problem, right? Once you are really touched by death, you are gone. And that also, and, and it also means, I believe, you can feel no self-efficacy with respect to death. Death is the loss of all self-efficacy, is the giving up, the losing, the, the go, fading away of all self-efficacy. And it's not transformation in the, in the way we know it, a kind of transformative, a process in which I play a role, in which I'm not just passively suffering, right? So uh, death is not about transformation, it's about an, an, annihilation. Whatever we think about what will come after death, those are just conceptions. So I, I would still say as a human being, a sociologist and a philosopher, it's impossible to be in, re in, in resonance with death itself. I, I think that still holds true despite of what I have to say in the third and fourth step. Now, uh, having said this, oh, hopefully it still works. I think it still works. Having said this, um, I still, uh, I, yeah, it's impossible to be in resonance with death, but of course it's possible to be in resonance with the fact that we are mortals. It's possible to be in, in resonance with our mortality, right? Something Heidegger, of course, suggested. If you cannot be in resonance with your mortality, you don't live at all, he would probably have said, right? And uh, furthermore, we can, of course, be or get in resonance with the dead. Right. Uh, th this I find very interesting. This is what people in almost all cultural uh, contexts I know of have tried uh, in the, when I think uh, of anthropology, right, of the, uh, uh, the ancient Babylonians, Egyptians, Chinese, Aztecs, uh, Indians, whatever it is. Um, uh, there was always a conception of the Greeks, of course, uh, that, that, the, that you can somehow get in resonance with our ancestors, with the realm of the dead, so to speak, or the realm of death, so to speak. 
And I believe, I mean, the, the ceremonies we do for people, for the deceased, for people who died, is about the transformation of an axis of, of an horizontal axis or a social axis of resonance between subject and subject, between two human beings, in a kind of vertical axis of resonance, an existential axis of resonance, as I call it. Because, of course, people still feel connected to their loved ones, their family, their fathers, their mothers, their loved ones, their children, if they go first. But this connection is now different. It's no longer between people you can talk to, but it's somehow in a, in a different sphere, in an utter ultimate reality, like in heaven or in Hades or wherever it might be. right? So, um, And I think the, the funeral ceremonies is about the transformation. Now, yes, I, I'm still in, 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 a, in a sphere of resonance with my mother, let's say. Uh, let's say with my mother, right? But she is no longer a subject I can talk to. See, she is now in heaven or wherever she might be, right? So I think it's really, we, we discussed this in our doctoral school and I liked it very much uh, when uh, when uh, one of the doctoral students talked about the music, right? While the band, the funeral procession band, played the tunes of mourning and sadness until the end of the cemetery, right? It changed to more happily worldly tunes uh, outside of the cemetery because this is really the transformation. It's a symbol of the transformation of the axis uh, of resonance. Right now we have to go back to life and we have a different form of connection to those who died. So I think, yes, it's possible to, uh, to be in a resonance with the dead, but not with death. And of course, as I said, we can be in resonance with the fact of our mortali mortality and we can feel some sense of self-efficacy with the fact that we are mortals, right? And even transformation through uh, coming to terms with it, right? I, I, I think Simon Weil, Simon Weil I, I, I think I have it on one of the slides, I, don't, I forgot on which one, said uh, to philosophize is to learn to die, right? Something like uh, something of this, right? The art of dying almost. I think this is uh, the idea is of coming to terms with death, right? Integrating the thought that one day we will be gone, our life is ending, right? We have to somehow get in resonance with this fact. And I think that is somehow possible, right? Preparing uh, for, for the fact of dying, coming to terms with it, or even living towards death. Um, and then, of course, there are other forms of how we try to get in resonance with our mortality, for example, even deciding for ourselves when, um, when, when, we, are, when we go, when we die, or trying to regulate the heritage and everything that comes after us are at least attempts to be in uh, resonance with, with mortality, but not with death. Uh, here is the quote, right, to philosophize is to learn to die, uh, which is very interesting, right? That, that I think means that philosophy is about getting in resonance, accepting the fact that we die as not just an alienating fact, but a resonant fact. It speaks to me, right? And yes, I can do something with it. I can even draw positive energy, which is also a topic by Simon Weil, out of this, right? So, um, and then then I find, actually, I found in Simone Weil, this is why I got, as I said, I got obsessed with her over the over the course of this weekend, because she has a, a, a the, the, she has this conception that death is only a kind of utterly alien, right? Utterly um, an element of alienation. If I conceive of myself as a kind of separated, isolated atom in the universe, right? And when I, when I die, it's kind of put into extinction, annihilated, and then it's gone. That's a very non-resonant thought, so to speak. But it seems to me that Simon Weil really, really formulated and he maybe even experienced a, 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 a very different experience that we are kind of part of a greater whole. She talks about the, 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 the universe really, right? And she says it's a double law we are ruled by, right? Uh, on the one hand, we live in an indifferent, I would call it alienated universe, right? Where, where the world is indifferent, silent, maybe even hostile to us. But we also live in mysterious complicity with it. That's how I read it. Unfortunately, one cannot read the whole uh, quote here. Um, um, maybe we'll find another way or you even uh, to, to transport it to you. Or maybe you already know the quote, right? But uh, the, the thing is, uh, this double law is um, that the, the, the spectacle of beauty, so to speak, which pierces our heart is about, is that we are connected to the universe, to the whole, right? in a kind of in a in a resonant way and then dying does not mean the atom is annihilated it's just transformed it transforms its form of attachment of relationship uh, to the universe right so the uh, yeah it's it's a pity one cannot read it at least i cannot read it right now on this um, 
on the screen. But the thing is, she says, if I am anything other than the universe, I will suffer by death. But if I am the universe, I think it's the image of the drop and the ocean, right? Then I'm connected. I'm still vibrating. I'm 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 connected to the past. I'm connecting to the connected to the future, to the other living being, and this play of resonance. The, tone of love which is at the bottom of our existence will carry on i think this is a conception of mortality to which we can get in resonance uh, or we can be in resonance with right? but still it would not mean to be in resonance with death itself right it's a philosophical connection connection which allows me to, one could say to be in consolation with the fact of my death but i don't want to talk about uh, consolation because i think it's really kind of resonance with because I, I i live with the fact that i die i come to terms with it i answer it and it means something to me I, it, it gives meaning to my to the way i live it at the very least okay so so uh, as i said as I said, yeah, well, I'm already over time, so I'll hurry up a bit, right? If we if we are a part of the greater whole, uh, then then at least death changes its meaning, right? Oh, I already quoted the double law here, so you see it here. It's easier to read. Oh, here we have the whole quote, but I already talked about this, right? If the uh, however, if however the universe is as it were another body to my soul my death ceases to have any more importance for me than that of a stranger i think this i mean this so sounds a bit like a banalization to me but nevertheless i cherish the idea i, I think i mean for example when my father died i think i i i, I talked about this in our graduate school before he said well everything was in vain right he, not, not when he died when he was very old we would walk through our village for example and he said oh this is where my friend lived but he is dead and so it's all in vain and this is where i met my wife for example but now it's gone it's all in vain because it's dead right and i think what uh, simon Weil's idea of of this the universe is another body to my soul right means no it still lives on i'm still connected to it this play this game this resonant game is uh, going on uh, beyond my physical death right and then she says so i want to say i she says in other parts that the that the the, the spiritual fact what the what her writing and thinking even is about i believe is that we need to change our relationship to the world it should not be the relationship of the split atom which uses uh, the universe or which suffers by it the world right so you have a mechanical or instrumental relationship that's in a relationship which cannot allow for coming to terms uh, or getting in resonance with mortality right but uh, so, so, so she she says we have to change the relationship between our body and the world so you know what i want to do or what i do the subtitle of my book on resonance is uh, our um, uh, a sociology of our relationship to the world so simon Weil, that's why i'm obsessed with her right now she talks talks about the, the necessity to change to transform this relationship to the world right we change our attachment we must attach ourselves to the all i'm not sure whether this is the correct translation right the all sounds german the universe we have to feel the universe through each sensation i mean this this really means to me we, we can get we can be in resonance with the universe as the utter reality or the totality and once you're in that state mortality becomes a resonant fact so to speak right but not death so far right so i really tried Oh, by the way, uh, by the way, the very last thing uh, I have to say it because I, I love that very much. But it's on the on the previous slide, and um, she really develops the, a sense of a medio passivity, which I want to work about. My next book maybe will have that title, namely a state between being active and being passive, right? And Simon Weil seems to say that yes, attention is such a state, right? It's it's attention, so it's a kind of active involvement. Uh, focusing of attention but it's also kind of passive experience it's exactly halfway between active and passive which is her um, mystical experiences i believe and that's a kind of state which uh, maybe which allows us to be in resonance with mortality but the last step 
that, that that's I mean this this idea the last idea I believe is a kind of sublation of death in, in a resonant universe a sublation in the sense of Hegel Aufhebung. Uh, but I want I want to kind of you know once I got here I wanted to push one step further and rethink the idea of whether or not it's possible to be in resonance with death or not. So far I said no. Now I want to finish with some ideas about whether maybe. There is one way of having a hunch, at least, an idea of being in resonance with death. I, I like this idea of Simone Weil when she says life in our world, I think, is but a lie. It's only a lie and only death is true. And this really made me think because I thought, yeah, well, somehow it's true. I always thought pain is much truer than joy right? because it seems to be an utter reality. And now Simone Weil has the same idea about um, death. And I, I can imagine, yeah, because death is the only thing that's absolutely certain. Maybe it's because of this. And then I thought, I tried to think about whether people talk about experiences of hearing the call of death itself. Right? Of course, actually death knocking on one's door. There are many, many, many stories, right? Even in folk, folk stories and so on, and uh, fairy tales. Um, but this is, this I think is, you know, death there is just a metaphor for the knowledge of mortality, I believe, right? So I, well, I don't know. I, I just try to think of uh, experiences, basically uh, aesthetic experiences, of, of, of hearing death's call. And the first thing that came to my mind is a song by, Black Sabbath, you know, the rock band, which is quite an occult rock band for me, because because when I I came to learn them or to hear them and actually to love them at an age when I was still quite young and I always feel, felt, you know, I, I got kind of goosebumps and I felt kind of uncomfortably drawn towards them because they were thinking singing about these really dark things. They were singing about Satan and so on, right? So so I was always in a kind of awe and shock and, and fear and so on. And they have this one th this one song when death calls, right? Here it comes, here it comes, I can feel it, right? And I thought this is really, you know, this gave me the creeps, I think, as the English would say. Certainly, I did not hear death there, and Black Sabbath certainly didn't do it either. I mean, it actually, the, the lyrics are quite silly, so, so it only works as a kind of aesthetic experience. So I don't know what that really means, but it's the idea that there is some utter truth to my life, which I might get in contact with when I believe I hear death's call, something of that sort. And then I remembered that it's not just the, you know, the occult band of Black Sabbath. You find that in Johann Sebastian Bach too, right? Come sweet death, come süßer tod, a very old song, right? And I, so I, I studied the lyrics of that too. Oh, no, this I didn't want to show you. It doesn't matter. Hopefully it's still running. Yes. At least now it's running. Um, so yeah, Bach, of course, is about the yearning for the heaven, I believe. It's a very religious uh, song, of course, so I'm not sure whether it's really the call of death that one hears through or in his uh, song either. Or I thought of the doors. Actually, this is some uh, idea, Tom Sawyer, uh, Tom Sawyer, Tom Sawyer. Tom Sawyer sounds like Mark Twain, right? Uh, gave me, uh, this is the end, a beautiful friend. This is the end, my only friend, the doors. It's also, I think it's a very mystical experience also for many people who listen to it, right? Could death be my only friend? I think this is about a kind of utter negation probably in life. And then I encountered, I have to hurry up. Rainer Maria Rilke, Der Tod ist groß. I'm not sure, probably the poem has been translated into English, but I couldn't find it quickly. Uh, but this is, I think this is really kind of shocking, right? Der Tod ist groß, wir sind die Seinen. Wenn wir uns mitten im Leben meinen, wagt, oh, wagt er zu weinen, mitten in uns. Now this, I think, is a, this is, this is a kind of description of resonance with death, right? When, when I'm happy and full of life, somehow I feel the the crying of death within myself and now connect this to the idea that only death is true. So this is, I'm not sure whether this is a kind of resonance, right? Something is calling me, something, something speaks to me and it transforms me even when I'm in the middle of life and I have to respond to it. Now here, I'm not sure whether this is death or mortality we might be in resonance with, right? 
But uh, but I, I thought also when reading the parts of Simone Weil, I, as I said, I'm not an expert and maybe I totally mistook her, but I thought she somehow had this idea that death could be the one, the only element of pure resonance. Because, you know, I always think of resonance as two things, two entities being in resonance with each other. And these two entities have to be different, right? But the relationship comes first and then... Well, that's the idea I got here. I'm not sure whether it's uh, mystical or uh, philosophical or just crazy, right? I thought, well, resonance for me is a form of relationship. I always talk about the ontological priority, right? Uh, on, uh, uh, relational onto ontology, which means the relationship, the resonance comes first. And then the two things, like the two subjects, are kind of al almost the result of resonance. And maybe resonance for Simone Weil, no, maybe death, is the one state, the one experience where there are not two poles, two ends, two entities, but it's just the pure tone. I think she talks at one point of the, the, the lowest tone of our existence, which is love. And it seemed to me that it's also death, right? So death could be the uh, the pure resonance, the sound of pure resonance without two uh, relator. Right? She she talks about death as an instant instantaneous state without past or future, right? It's the kind of this singular moment but uh, of course yeah i'm not sure whether we can really be in resonance with it i mean f in the end it's only kind of philosophical concept here right but i want to end nevertheless with this idea and this is again one uh, by tom he, he kind of made me think of it oh yeah he, 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 i think he actually suggested the thought uh, right that uh, you know i i made the argument in one of my talks that i said even we believe that we listen to nature you know i might go to the forest or to the ocean or to the mountains and believe that i really hear the i follow the call of nature and then the question is whom do i really follow what do i hear when i believe i listen to the voice of nature and it's the same with who whom, who do i really hear when i believe that i'm in touch with god right or with history and my claim was that in the end it's probably only it's 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 the it's always a kind of social construction at least power relations are involved in the voice of nature the voice of history or the voice of god which i believe are here but maybe maybe just a weird idea maybe the social construction ceases when i hear death's call right so so maybe hearing death's call of course is not that he speaks to me because that would already al already transform death into something else so maybe i only hear the gap that seems to be so important for simon Weil and also for tom uh, sawyer when he when he talks about the cross and the meaning of the cross the utter gap the thing which is not expressible can be death and maybe probably it takes a mystical experience to be in resonance with it so as you see here and realize i'm not completely sure about the argument i want to make as a sociologist and philosopher and rational being i would say there is no resonance with death but as a kind of person with aesthetic sensibilities right and maybe even mystical leanings i think maybe she has a point here and it's possible to be in uh, resonance with death but uh, whatever interpretation is right i'm looking forward to having a chance to discuss it with maybe all of you thank you very much for listening and that's it for now thanks more information on our network the transdisziplin denk collective as well as on the conference you'll find at www.simonwey-denkkollektiv.de feel free to contact us and to join the discussion